This is part four of chapter 55 in our final portion of this chapter. And we were talking about trophic or actually um, production efficiency. And when we're talking about production efficiency, we can also look at trophic efficiency in terms of ecological pyramids. So our last um, topic was looking at that caterpillar and how its efficiency um, is a very small portion of what it actually eats from the um, leaf, from the plant source. Um, what has been added to its biomass is actually the amount of energy that has been added to it to pass on to the next level. Um, so if we look at this in terms of the whole trophic level, the trophic efficiency is the percentage of production that's transferred from one level to the next. And that's where we get that number again of about 10% with a range of actually 5 to 20% being able to be passed on. And trophic efficiency is multiplied over the length of a food chain. So when we're looking at the entire um, productivity of an ecosystem or of a food chain, we're going to look at the entire chain. So a pyramid of net production represents the loss of energy with each transfer in that food chain. So if you look at this um, example that we have here, um, approximately one-tenth of one percent of chemical energy that was fixed in photosynthesis by the producers actually is going to reach that tertiary consumer. Um, so this is looking at this type of particular food chain. But in general, the different organisms have different um, efficiencies in terms of what they can pass down. Um, for example, birds and mammals have efficiencies that are very low. They're in the range of 1 to 3 percent because they have a high cost of endothermy, of maintaining their homeostasis. Fish have a production efficiency of about 10%, so they're getting a little bit better. And insects and microorganisms have efficiencies of 40% compared to the 1% to 3% of birds and mammals, which starts to become kind of interesting when we're thinking of the numbers of insects versus the number of mammals on Earth. So our last section, 55.5, um, is going to be talking about restoration ecology. And there's just a few terms that you really should become familiar with. Um, one of them is bioremediation. Um, the other is augmentation. So these are two ways that ecologists can help return an ecosystem back to its more natural state. Um, because given time, biological communities can recover from many types of disturbances, whether they're natural um, disturbances or man-made disturbances. So there's a whole field of ecology called restoration ecology that actually looks into how can they speed up or even begin the rec recovery of a injured ecosystem. So those two types of um, restoration um, start with bioremediation and that's using organisms to basically detoxify an ecosystem. Most often the organisms that they're going to use are going to be prokaryotes, fungi, or plants. Um, for example, the bacteria Shewanella um, can metabolize uranium and, and actually some other elements as well to an insoluble form that's less likely to leach into streams and groundwater water destroying the water cycle. So that simple bacteria being inter introduced into a toxic ecosystem is one example of bioremediation. So it's living, using a living organism to help clean things up. These organi organisms take up, um, sometimes metabolize, the toxic molecules. On the other hand, biological augmentation is using organisms to add the essential materials 
that are missing in a degraded ecosystem. So in this case, something has been leached out. So when we were talking about deforestation and we have all this runoff taking away the nitrogen um, from that ecosystem, there are ways to reintroduce nitrogen into that system um, to try and bring back the, that essential mineral so that plants can then do their production and then pass on energy throughout the entire ecosystem's trophic levels. Uh, and another example of augmentation is adding this mycorrhizal fungi um, to help plants access nutrients in the soil. So this is a way to actually increase the productivity of plants by using um, something that is a living biologic um, organism to augment the augment being improve um, the ecosystem. So the one the nitrogen fixing plants actually was the one example that I used before about how to increase nitrogen in the soil. So what we're going to lead into next um, are look is looking at some of the human impact to ecosystems. So we're going to look at fertilizers, um, acid rain, toxins in the environment, um, global warming um, through the greenhouse gas, um, also rising atmospheric carbon dioxide and the depletion of ozone. And these are the portions of Chapter 56 that we're going to take a quick look at. So the two sections in Chapter 56 are talking about what the human impact has been on ecosystems. The essential knowledge that we're covering is um, that human activities impact ecosystems on local, regional, and global scales. And evidence of student learning is being able to um, describe or define um, how human populations have increased in numbers and that impact on habitats. Um, or other species has been magnified, and also how reducing the population size of certain species has resulted in habitat destruction, and in some cases extinction of species. So these are two examples. Um, another portion of the College Board um, learning objectives is that you're able to um, describe an illustrative example. So we're going to look um, quickly at the Dutch elm disease. Um, Dutch elm disease, um, of course, affects elm trees. And it is actually a wilt disease that's called by ascomycete fungi um, that originated, they believe, um, someplace in Asia and spread um, across the world, actually. Um, by way of infected um, elm lumber. And so infected lumber traveling to um, Europe and to North America spread this disease um, to healthy elm trees. And so you could almost say this is an invasive species um, because it has followed the same pattern that an invasive species would. But in this case, it's actually an invasive pathogen. And so the result has been, what you're seeing in this picture is the elm bark beetle. So this is normally a parasite um, that eats the bark of an elm tree, and it doesn't destroy the tree. But the problem is these bark beetles can get into their system this um, elm disease fungi which um, will get into the vascular system of the elm tree and, de and destroy the tree, actually kill it. So in a couple pandemics of this disease, um, there have been just catastrophic losses of elms. Um, there were 30 million elms killed in the United Kingdom alone in one episode of the spread of this disease. And it's been even worse in North America because in the UK and in Europe, there are like 30 different types of elms. But in North America, there are only like five or six different types of elm trees. And so there were hundreds of millions of elm trees that died 
in one pandemic of this invasive pathogen. What um, is important to think about, and when we're studying um, evolution again, um, this will start to make a lot more sense, but what has happened with this um, is similar to what happens with invasive species in that they, when you introduce a new species into a new environment, um, you're losing the original, like where it was endemic, there was a balance there that kept that pathogen from just running rampant and destroying all of its hosts. But when it's introduced into a new place, what can occur is there are different um, hosts, there are different vectors, such as these beetles, um, there are diff there's a different temperature, there are just different environmental pressures that actually cause there to be a natural selection occurring at a more rapid pace. So we have it actually becoming even better adapted to its new environment because of it being introduced to a foreign environment. So it actually has led to deforestation. So a lot of times we think of deforestation as being entirely man-made, whether it's an accidental forest fire caused by man or actually cutting down trees. But it can occur naturally through things like this, even though indirectly it was man who brought in the diseased lumber. Um, but any change in a forest, um, um, making it an area that is converted to grazing land or urban development, um, what, or maybe the forest is just cut down for logging reasons, it's going to reduce the biodiversity. Um, and the other problems we looked at is that it can degrade and interrupt the different biogeochemical cycles. Um, it can not only, we talked about nitrogen already, and also the interruption to the water cycle, but it also can interrupt the carbon storage um, and so interrupt the carbon cycle. Um, and just in review, it throws off the regulation of the water balance and river flow. Um, and all of those things, when you throw off the water cycle, you're going to possibly change the climate patterns of an area. It also increases the effect of infectious diseases because if you're lowering um, the health of an environment, it's obviously going to be more susceptible to pathogens. Um, speaking of forests, um, we're going to touch briefly on rainforests. Um, a lot of deforestation has been occurring in rainforests, and as we saw with the satellite image of um, efficiency of production, Rainforests are very important um, to the entire um, health of the Earth's ecosystem. They're home to two-thirds of all living animal and plant species on Earth. They're, they have the greatest biodiversity. And even though they only cover a small part of the Earth's surface, um, they're home to over half the species of plants and animals on Earth. So when we have deforestation occurring there, we're really threatening the biodiversity of the planet. Let's see. So the next thing that I want to talk about is acid rain. So acid precipitation or acid rain is the term used to describe ways that acid falls from the atmosphere. So there are two types of acid rain. There's the wet type, which would be where we got the term acid rain. And then we also have um, dry deposition, which is when we have acid present in dust or smoke that sticks to the ground, cars, buildings, and trees. So we see this occurring typically like if you park your car at the airport and leave it for a week while you're traveling, and you come back and you see your car is filthy. What you're seeing is acid deposition on your car from the carbon that is being burned by the jet airplanes. This is a picture showing how this occurs. So we can have natural causes of acid rain like volcanoes or decaying vegetation, but the human causes have been much more prolific. Um, what is spewed out of factories or other production facilities 
Um, the use of fossil fuels, like with the jet airplanes, large airplanes, 